Okay, and so this um, uh, video, I'm going to cover a social cognitive perspective as well as trait uh, uh, perspective, and then um, or trait theories, and then uh, I will. Then we we should be very close to being done with personality. Um, I have a few more slides that I'll do at the beginning of class. Um, on our next class and then we will jump into the next uh, chapters material and then we should be right on tar target in terms of the syllabus. Um, so just very briefly, um, the social cognitive perspective is really emphasizing, uh, and Albert Bandura was a big proponent of this, um, looking at uh, conscious self-regulated behavior, not looking at unconscious mental influences or instinctual drives. They believe that that was a waste of time um, and believed that, you know, our sense of self can depend, uh, depends on our thoughts and behaviors and, and, and feelings based on the situation that we're in. So, you know, who we are and what we feel like we are may be situationally dependent. And that was kind of like the biggest, one of the biggest things that, that, um, that uh, social cognitive perspective brought to the table. Um, in essence, you are a different person when you're sitting in class versus when you're at a funeral. You're at, you are a different person when you are at the movie theater than when you're at a rock concert. Um, you know, all of these are dictated by appropriate behaviors that are given in that particular situation. And your sense of self can change based on your situation. So if you're with family, you may act a certain way. If you are with uh, peers, you're going to act a certain way. When you are in a uh, professional setting, you will act a different way. And these, all of these thoughts, feelings, and behaviors based on the situation are going to change based on context. Now, the really great thing about social uh, cognitive personality theory is that a lot of this information has actually been um, uh, uh, demonstrated through empirical work, through experimental findings. And so uh, social cognitive perspective is a very, very big proponent of using uh, the lab and using lab settings to find out information about how it is that we behave. Now. The one interesting thing about uh, uh, about these theories is the idea that we have what's called a reciprocal determinant determinism, and so what this is is in essence that our behavior is caused by the interaction of behavioral, cognitive, environmental factors, and so. Um, this would be a great time to be able to draw this on the board, but I'm kind of limited with what I have here. But imagine that there is an arrow going, in a, let's put this in a triangle. There is an arrow going from behavior to cognition, and then an arrow going from cognition to environment, and then environment arrow going from environment to behavior. And so what you end up having is, arrows going in all directions. So we have a relationship between behavior and cognition, a relationship behavior and environment, and a relationship between cognition and environment. And those arrows have arrowheads going in all directions. So your behavior influences your cognition. Your cognition can influence your behavior. Your behavior can influence your environment. Your environment can influence both behavior and cognition. So this is arrows going in all different directions that we, in essence, are we change our behavior based on our environment. We also change our cognition based on our environment, but we also change our environment based on our behavior and our cognitions. It's this reciprocal relationship that goes round and round in circles. And so what we find is that a person's cognitive skills, abilities, and attitudes are going to be represented by what we refer to as your self-system. And your self-system is going to guide how you perceive, evaluate, and control your behavior given those different situations. Your self-system is able to direct you into what makes the most sense for you to do, to behave, to think, given those circumstances. And this is, uh, and this idea of self-efficacy, which is the most critical element that influences our self-system, is uh, the belief that we have. That, so self-efficacy is the belief that we that that we that people have about their ability to meet demands of a specific situation. Um, and our self-efficacy is how confident we are in whatever it is that we're doing. So it could be that 
you see a child and the child is struggling with trying to tie their shoes. Well, if they have really so low, low self-efficacy, they may say, well, I just can't do this and there's nothing that I can do. And if you encourage the child to in, in increase their uh, expectation and increase their confidence in their ability, what ends up happening is that increases their self-efficacy and they go, oh wait, okay, I can do this. And if you can work with a child to tie their shoes, then the next, obstacle that they face. You can say, well, you know, you, you learn to tie your shoes and you did a really good job there. And what that ends up doing is that increases their sense of self-efficacy and allows them to go on to do uh, other um, tasks and be able to have that confidence to do that. And that confidence, that self-efficacy is that is what influences our self-system. And that allows us to be able to act appropriately in given different situations because we know that we can do it. Now, when we look at some of the strengths, we have some really great empirical lab research. Uh, it's had a major impact to the study of personality because now we know, okay, you know, we have some actual empirical work, empirical evidence. And it also emphasizes the self-regulation of behavior. It may, it puts you back in the driver's seat. It says, you know, you are responsible for your behavior. You regulate your own behavior. Don't blame it on some instinctual urge that you don't even know that you have. This is, you behave the way that you do because of your experience, because of your environment, because of your cognitions, and you are in control of your behavior. Now, some major limitations of this is honestly, um, you know, we may not have a good indication that those lab experiences actually reflect how complex human interactions are in the real world. And we also know that uh, there is some element of a consciousness and then emotions um, and in conflict with our own emotions and our own experiences can actually um, influence our behavior much more than the social cognitive perspective um, lets on. And so this is just something that you have to, um, to think about in terms of um, uh, limitation of this particular perspective. Now the last uh, theory that we're going to talk about is the trait perspective. And so I'm going to start going into this kind of briefly um, and then we will go over some of these things, uh, some testing uh, ways in, in class. Um, and so we've already talked about traits in class where I've had you guys kind of name out some traits of your friends. And a trait is, is a relatively stable and enduring predis predisposition to behave a certain way. Um, we have about 4,000 English words to describe specific personality traits. So there's a lot out there. And the theorists, the trait theorists, are interested in identifying, describing, and measuring those individual differences in behavioral predispositions. So the other theories that we've talked about in terms of personality wants to get at the whole person. The trait theorists want to break this down and see that we are a co unique combination of these traits, these characteristics or attributes. Um, so, you know, the psychoanalytic, humanistic, social cognitive theories uh, perspectives all focus on how similar people are, are, whereas the trait perspective focuses primarily on how how we are different, those individual differences. So when we look at the different trait theorists, we have Raymond Cattell. Uh, and so he proposed 16 personality factors. And he used a very fancy analysis called factor analysis to identify those different, fact, uh, those, those different factors and break down which ones were the biggest components. And so he developed something called the 16 personality factor questionnaire or 16 PF, which is still used today. But the problem is, and I like to liken this whole thing to like Goldilocks and the three bears. So just like Goldilocks has, you know, the, we'll, we'll talk about the porridge. So daddy's porridge was too hot. Mama's porridge was too cold, but baby's porridge was just right. So this is kind of like how I like to think about these trait theories. So Raymond Cattell's 16 um, personality factors was deemed as like way too much. People were like, you know, 16 is just too many traits to think about. Let's look at something else. And so <clears throat> Raymond Cattell's 16 personality factor would be kind of like daddy's porridge. Um, Papa Bear's porridge is way too hot. Raymond Cattell's personality factor is way too much. So Hans Eysenck is another trait theorist who believed that we in essence had um, three source traits that could be broken down into four basic types. Okay, so the four basic types is introverted neurotic, introverted stable, 
extroverted neurotic and extroverted stable. And so what he believed was that we directed our energy inward and outward in terms of introversion and extroversion, very similar to how we saw it being described by, um, by, uh, by psycho by neo freudians okay and believe that neuroticism was how likely a person was going to be become upset emotionally so depending on where you were on those those spectrums so if you were you know high highly introverted okay um but also highly neurotic then you would be in the introverted neurotic category you know if you were highly introverted but stable Okay, uh, meaning that you weren't neurotic, you were uh, not easily emotionally upset, then you would be considered introverted stable. And there's just these, these four combinations of these, uh, of these options of introversion versus extroversion or neuroticism versus stability. Now, there is a third source trait called uh, psycho, uh, psychoticism, which in essence is a spectrum. Um, if you are very psychotic, then you would be antisocial, cold, hostile, unconcerned about others. Uh, if you would rank very high, excuse me, very high psychotic or psychoticism if you, uh, if you demonstrate these, these, um, these traits. And if you are on the end of, other end of that spectrum, um, then you would be, you know, low psychoticism and you would care about others and very warm. And he believed that these individual differences were actually due to biological differences. So for example, an introvert has a nervous system that's more easily aroused and can actually explain uh, these personality traits due to their biological differences. And so what this next, uh, this, this next um, picture is, in, in essence, is, is a graphical representation of these four basic types. And you can see how each of these types has sort of a um, set of characteristics that's, that, that is associated with that. So if you have an introvert, introvert a neurotic person, um, they would be, you know, on the on the, the the one end, they would be emotionally unstable as well as you know direct their energies inward. We might call them pessimistic, quiet, moody, anxious, rigid, might describe some of the traits that this particular category of people might have. Now the problem with iSync's representations is that most people believed that three were too few. Three main source characteristics were just too few. Um, to to really demonstrate a proper personality um, theory. And so this would be very similar to Mama Bear's too cold porridge. So now what's the just right? So we have 16 or too many personality factors and three or too few. So McCray and Costa were actually, their five factor model was considered like the baby bear's perfect core porridge. Um, they believed that there were five um, major factors where you actually uh, land on a particular spectrum, okay? And so the big five, this is neuroticism, and you can rank from high to low on the spectrum on any of these factors. Extroversion, openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And these are the five basic personality dimensions. So that's neuroticism, extroversion, openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And the McCray and Costa was actually, they were able to test this in over 50 cultures and determine that these were actually really stable over different cultures, which makes us think that these elements of personality are universal. We find that there's probably biological and, and based in evolution, since these are probably adaptive to our survival as human beings. Yeah, uh, McCray and Costa also found that these traits were actually very stable over lifespan. Um, neuroticism might be one that is less stable. People tend to get less neurotic as they get older. But in essence, these traits were actually pretty stable over a lifespan. And we see that they are pretty consistent over different situations. Um, and we do see some very specific brain activities and structures that are related to some of these uh, personality traits. Now, when we look at how it is that these personality traits are, uh, you know, how is it that people are uh, similar and how are they different? Um, when we look at some uh, at behavioral genetics, which is basically looking at genes and heredity, looking at things like twin studies, twins who are separated at birth, who grew up at you know, different areas of the world, what we find is that twin studies show that openness to experience, conscientiousness, and agreeableness are all influenced by genetics to a lesser extent. So we don't see those traits 
um, you know, uh, as common in, in identical twins. Um, and we see that typically as twins grow up and leave home, these personalities can actually diverge a little bit. Um, and it shows that, you know, it, they can be influenced by ex uh, environment and experience of these particular traits that I, that I just mentioned. Um, we also find that um, when we look at uh, you, studying genetics and studying these behavioral traits, we have to kind of see um, what, you know, what degree of relatedness are we looking at? Are we looking like father to son? Are we looking mother to daughter? Um, are we looking at grandparents? Are we looking at identical twins? Are we looking at siblings? And so, you know, being able to kind of see how closely these individuals are related can give us a really good indication of how strong this heredit, uh, how, how, how hereditary these, these traits are. We also find that um, that uh, extroversion and eroticism tend to have more of a genetic influence, um, and that again is based off of, of these genetic studies. So openness to experience, conscientiousness, and agreeableness are not as influenced by genetics when we compare them to things like extroversion and eroticism. Now, when we look at the strengths and, and weaknesses and limitations of the trait perspective, uh, what we find is that some major strengths is that um, you know most most people can agree that you know we can describe our friends and who we know um, on these traits, and and we are able to can, you know grab some of these uh, individual characteristics that individuals have, and we can describe us how we describe people to each other is is based off these traits. Um, but some major limitations of the trait theory is, you know, this doesn't really get at human personality. I mean, it gets at some traits and characteristics, but, you know, what makes a human human and what makes personality what it is? Um, it doesn't explain why or even how these individual differences develop. It just, it just shows that there are differences. So it, it fails to address some really other important personality issues that the other perspectives get at. For example, um, you know, cognitive effects, behavioral effects, um, environmental environment, um, looking at even unconscious forces is, is definitely not described at all by the trait perspective. And so this can, uh, it, it, you know, looking specifically at personality. And so these are some major limitations. Now, what we'll do is um, we'll end, uh, we'll start class next time with a few slides on how we assess personality, um, just because we have some fun Rorschach tests for you guys to look at. Um, and then we will start a new section, a new chapter um, during our next class. So hopefully you found these videos very helpful. If you have any questions, of course, you can always email me or ask me in class. Have a great day.